All is changed when Jesus comes. He just shuts out the darkness and scatters the light. <laughs> We're thankful for that. Amen. Now, uh, that's Becky's first time to play in church here, so a uh, very appropriate song, When Jesus Came. So we are grateful to be here again tonight and so thankful for the, your fine attendance this morning. And now, uh, tonight, is uh, I've got a little subject I want to talk on in a few moments, but just before that, I've got some announcements to make and things, and i just a teeny bit hoarse. <clears throat> I uh, think it's just the over-speaking. I uh, preach a long time, but when I take these hour or two tapes and when I come back here, it's because that I'm taping that for uh, around the world. And uh, so uh, I thank you for being so patient with us this morning. Now there's a few things I would like to make mention of right here. That is that I... I would like to ask the church, the first thing, uh, something that I have, um, have uh, a done, and I, I want to ask if I can change that tonight. We're not, I don't make New Year's vows, and I'm, we've got to go home tomorrow, so we won't be here for New Year's, to, but we'll be remembering you. And I believe there'll be a meeting here New Year's night. Yeah, that's right. Uh, a watch service, as they always have on New Year's night. We like to stay, but we just can't get back in time then to, to get the kiddies in school. And uh, my wife's got to wash up their clothes, you know. <laughs> so um, I want to thank each one of you for your fine things that you did for us through Christmas. And you women who went up there and put food in the house and things for us, that when we got there, there was, stuff was already cooked and ready to eat. I certainly thank you for that. May God ever bless you and the church for their little ticket that I could go over here and, and uh, get uh, some clothes if I wanted them for a suit. They give me a suit each year, and uh, some kind friends of mine just got me a suit, so I think if uh, it's all right, I need some other things, like shirts and undershirts and things. I'd like to take the money up and that if it's all right with the church. I uh, need that better than I, worse than I do the suit right at the time. Now. This uh, young fellow that just sang for us, Brother George Smith from down in Tucson, we've been going up to their church up there, the um, New Testament Baptist Church. His father is a missionary. I think he has about seven churches down in Old Mexico. And uh, there's certainly some fine people there. And his father and mother and all of them are fine people, and George is a very fine young man. I was just sorry that he didn't give us a word of testimony but well, before he sat down of the saving grace of Christ in his life. And now, the, the messages, I promised sure not long ago, that the messages before I went out in the meetings, I come here and tape them first and then go out. That was because of getting the tapes to the people. Then I come here and tape a message and then go out and preach it. That give the people a chance to, to the tape makers to make the tape and take it with us as we went. Now I'm fixing to leave on a great string of evangelistic tour. So uh, I won't be able to do that from now on, see. And uh, uh, the one who takes the tapes will just have to get them as we go along. And I think after all, aren't they having a meeting on tapes this week or something about something about the tapes this week? Anyhow, I think Brother Sothman is here and he represents Brother McGuire. I don't know whether he's here or not. I think Brother Fred's here. Somebody said he was here. And um, he... Um, I think they're having a meeting this week, maybe tomorrow night or sometime, about the tapes. We was talking about it the other night in the room there. I think the time is up for something that they take and make arrangements about it. So from now on, I'll probably just speak uh, messages that I haven't touched here at the tabernacle out in the meetings. And now I have, um, want to be grateful to God for uh, that testimony of Brother Blair. Happens to be that Brother and Sister Blair sitting right here tonight, sitting right here before us, the one that had the little boy. And I remember when the Lord uh, told me when he was, uh, Brother Blair all tore up, weeping. His little boy got cushed in the face like this of a turned over car, and he was very bad. But while I was uh, uh, praying, I saw the little fellow <laughs> all right. And Brother Blair, of course, Asked me, said, Brother Branham, is this uh, thus saith the Lord? I said, Brother Blair, it's thus saith the Lord. And 
Brother Blair is here tonight, and uh, we're certainly thankful to have Brother Blair with us. And he's been suffering with a, a little trouble of nervousness, and Satan gave him a great rap here not long ago to try to get him to disbelieve me. And while Satan was doing that, the Lord came right around and revealed it to him and told him about it, just to cut it off before the time come uh, for this. And Brother Blair's a fine man, and uh, I want you to remember him. He's kind of halt between opinions on what to do. He doesn't know just how to turn. And I trust, Brother Blair, that God, you're a great servant of Christ, and he's got plenty for you to do because the uh, lights are getting dim. Were you here this morning? Well, that's very fine. Now. Now, I suppose the next time I get to see maybe up in the spring a little bit, and by that time maybe we'll know whether we're going to hold the, the meetings or not here at uh, Jeffersonville during the time that I should have been in Norway and in the Scandinavian countries. Now, just before we take a text, because we got a prayer line coming up, and many are standing in the rooms and around the walls and so forth, and I know you, it's very hard on you. And I stood a many times myself, and I... Passed by a while ago, bringing the wife down. I noticed the people around the doors. And I thought, who says the gospel still is the most attractive thing there is in the world? Amen. It sure is. It's, it attracts those who are interested in it. Those who are not interested, of course, they don't. They, it won't be. But Jesus, if I said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all man unto me. How true that is. And when I get here, there's just so much to say. And... I have to kind of jot down what I'm going to say here for a while, or I, there's so much to say you just forget what you're going to say. Now, I understand that Brother uh, Ungren's father was baptized this morning in the name of Jesus Christ. And if Sister Ungren and them are here, uh, I'm sure that's a great thing to them because that's been their constant prayer for many years. And Brother Ungren, wherever you are, God richly bless you, my brother. And if that isn't correct, God make me answer for it at the day of the judgment. I know it's correct. I, I'll take the blame for that. That's exactly right, because it is the truth. You say, does it make any difference? It did to Paul. They asked how they'd been baptized. They said they'd already been baptized by John, the man that baptized Jesus. Paul said they had to come and be rebaptized again in the name of Jesus Christ. And not one person in the Bible was ever baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. No people was ever baptized like that to the organizing of the Catholic Church at the Laodicea Council at Laodicea, uh, Rome. That's where the first person was ever baptized using the titles. A fellow said to me the other day, I said, well, if the Lord Jesus, uh, that's his name. He said, well, I said, if a fellow come to you, he said, I don't think it makes any difference. I just caught him in his own doctrine. I said, if a man come to you and said, I am baptized in the name of the rose of Sharon, lily of the valley, in the morning star, would you say amen to that? He said, no, sir. I said, how would you, would you re-baptize him? He said, yes, sir. I said, how would you baptize him? He said, I'd baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And I said, that's the way I'd baptize him, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I said, now, rose of Sharon, lily of the valley, morning star is no name. He said, that's right, it's a title. I said, so is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, I'd baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So, I say, and he saw it. <laughs> it was Brother Joseph Matson Bose of Chicago, the hardest fellow I've ever had to break through. <laughs> I suppose I've got around three or 4,000 natives to baptize now when I get over in Africa with them. <laughs> be baptized over again. <clears throat> now, so we're grateful for the gospel light. And so now Jesus said when he was here on earth, I, what I hear that I speak. And now I'm going to say just for the next about 10 minutes or 15, just before I take my text in a very short text, and then we'll have the prayer line. I have come to a place in my ministry to where I'm I've got to, to say something. And uh, Jesus said that what he heard, that was what he spoke. And he said, I've called you my friends. And a friend tells his friends all things. Paul said in Acts 20, 27, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And may I join in tonight and say the same thing with that great saint of old? 
to the best of my knowledge, I have not, I have not shunned but declared to you the whole counsel of God. Someone was playing one of the tapes the other day. Just because it made somebody angry, they shot at him through the window, and a woman wounded. So perhaps someday I'll seal my testimony. But when that time comes, and it's, I'm ready to go. Until my time comes, there's nothing going to hurt me until that time. Now, we believe in the same gospel just the way the Bible is written. It's zeroed. And, and if the gun is exactly zeroed and in tune, if it strikes the target the first time, it'll strike it the second time and every time. If a tree or a limb vine puts out a branch and that branch bears a certain fruit, the next time the, br the vine puts out a branch, it'll bear the same kind of fruit. And if Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, and the first branch church that that vine put out, they wrote a book of Acts behind it. And that first branch baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they had the living God among them that did the same things among them that he did when he was on earth. Therefore, the people taken notice to them, though ignorant and unlearned, that they had been with Jesus because his life was through them. As I've said, if I had the spirit of, of Beethoven in me, I would write songs. If, Be if, I, if Beethoven lived in me, I'd be Beethoven. See? If Shakespeare lived in me, I'd be Shakespeare. I, I'd write poems and, and, and plays and so forth. If Shakespeare lived in me, and if Christ lives in me, the works of Christ you'll do. It's got to be. And what is Christ? The Word. He said, if ye abide in me, my word in you, then ask what you will. It'll be done because the words there just needs the light, and the light makes it live. So now I am going to say something to you now that I haven't said all along. That is the thing that we have looked forward to for so long, or at least many years, four or five years or maybe longer, the third pull has now been vindicated, and I'm sure you all know what it is. Now. Remember, there will never be an impersonation of that because it can't be. It cannot be. Now, it's inexistent. And I have, I am warned of this, that soon, right at this time now, it's just happened so it could identify its presence among you. See? But it will not be used in a great way until this council begins to tighten up. And when it does, when that does, the Pentecostals and so forth can almost impersonate anything to be done. But when that time comes, when the squeeze comes down, then you'll see what you've seen temporarily be manifested in the fullness of its power. Now, I must continue in evangelism. Just as I was commissioned first, I must continue on. Therefore, you've had the Word, and you know what to look for, how to stand. And I must continue on in evangelism, and friends of mine, keep still and just keep moving on, for the hour is approaching swiftly, see, that when something is going to be done. Now, you might see some little odd things. Happen for me. Nothing sinful, I don't mean that. But I mean something odd to what the regular trend. Because where I've reached to now in the ministry, I'm dropping back here, watching that spot and waiting for the time to use it. But it's going to be used. And everyone knows that for as certain as the first was identified, so has the second been identified. And if you'll think real closely, you who are spiritual, as the Bible says, here's to him that has wisdom, the third is properly identified. Amen. We know where it is. So the third pool is here. It is so sacred that I mustn't say much about it. As he told me in the beginning, said this, say nothing of it. You remember that years ago? It speaks for itself. But you, I've tried to explain the others, and I made a mistake. This will be the thing that, to my opinion, I don't say the Lord tells me this, this will be a thing that will start the rapture and faith for the going away. See? See? Uh, and it, um, I must lay quiet for just a little while. 
Now remember, and who's listening to this tape, you might see such a change in my ministry right away, dropping back, not going up, dropping back. We're right at the age now, and it can't be, can't go any further. We have to wait just a minute until this happens over here to catch up, then the time comes. But it's thoroughly identified. There's coming a time upon in this nation the word this nation is going to exercise all the power that the beast had before it, which was pagan Rome, when it became papal Rome. See? That this nation will do that. Revelation 13 plainly explains it. The lamb come up out of the earth. The other beasts come up out of water, thickness and multitudes of people. This lamb come up where there was no people. A lamb represents uh, religion, uh, the lamb of God. And remember, it spoke like a lamb. It was a lamb. And then after a while, it received power and spoke like a dragon and exercised all the, the dragon power the dragon had before him. And the dragon is Rome always. So don't you see, Roman denomination, a Mark Protestant denomination, a image unto the beast, making a power that will force all Protestants like a union. You'll have to be into this council of churches or you won't be able to have fellowship or to... to well, it's, it's practically that way now. You can't go to a church and preach unless you have a fellowship card or some identification. And now, on persons like ourselves, we're going to be cut out of all that altogether. And that's exactly because they won't be able to do it. It's tightening it. And then when that time comes and the press comes to a place to where you're pressed out, then watch what I'm fixing to tell you in a few minutes. Watch the third pull then. And it'll be absolutely to the total loss, but it, it will be for the bride in the church. Now, we're closer than it seems to be. I don't know when, but it's real, real close. I may be building a platform for somebody else to step on. I may be taken before that time. I don't know. And that time may be this coming week that the Holy Spirit will come with and bring Christ Jesus. He may come this next week. He may come yet tonight. I don't know when he will come. He doesn't tell us that. But I do believe that we are so close that I would never die with old age. Yet at 54 years old, I'll never die with old age until he's here. See? Unless I'm shot, killed, or something other, some way killed. This old age wouldn't kill me until he's come. And I believe that, and I want to say this, I've never said it before, but uh, uh, according to Scripture, according to what he said 30 years ago, 33 years ago on the river down there, in 19 and 33, rather, what he said, everything has happened just exactly. I may not do it, but this message will introduce Jesus Christ to the world. For as John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming, so is the message to forerun the second coming. And John said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. See? So it's, it paralleled it in every way, and I know it will. the message will go on. Now, there's been some great things take place along the road. This morning, I was having interviews in the room here, and a, a young a fellow by the name of Autry, he's probably still in here tonight. He's from San Antonio, Texas. He come to ask if one was going to Dallas, come in from California. We could drop in one night at uh, their uh, tabernacle just for one night, and they're looking it up uh, the next day or two to see if we can do that. And he was telling me about, I've never been to San Antonio since that first meeting. Now, the first meeting, when I come to San Antonio, I was there, I think, with Brother Coot and the, uh, and the International Bible School, and I forget the auditorium we had the service in. And it's either my first night or second night, I think the first night, when I was walking to the platform, someone's raised up in the building way back in the back and spoke with tongues like a, a machine gun firing. And you no more and sat down just a moment or two to one raised on the platform and give the interpretation. And I stopped at what he said. And I said to the man, do you know this man? He said, no, sir. And he said, uh, I said, how did you come here? He said, the people I worked for was, at, uh, was here tonight and they brought me. He a, was a cowboy. And I said, uh, what do you do? He said, do you know him? He said, no, sir, I've never seen him. And I said, what are you? And he was a, a merchant in the city. And what they said in the... the now, I was always, before I learned better, I was a little skeptic of speaking in tongues. I thought a lot of it was flesh, and it might be. But when this was said, that interpretation 
was exactly what the angel of the Lord said down the river eleven years before that. And John the Baptist was sent to forerun the first coming of Christ. You're sent to forerun the second. See? There it was, and that angel, that light, that's been thoroughly identified both by the church, by the word, by science, and everything has identified it. That light, for its first time to appear in public, standing right over where I was at about two o'clock in the afternoon at the foot of the bridge, right, uh, right down here at the foot of Spring Street, in the water. Now that's been many, many years ago, and exactly what it said has come to pass to the dot. This brother uh, here was telling me this morning. He married a girl out of the church, her sister Noy's uh, daughter. Now, I don't know, I guess a young man, are you here, a brother, uh, Autry? I don't know, he was from San Antonio. I don't know whether he's here or not. Uh, he was here this morning. And he was telling me, I believe it was his grandfather, during that meeting, had been an epileptic all of his life and was brought there. That's the first beginning of the ministry when it said that if the discernment was putting their hands upon mine, and what would be said would be what it was. And I told you, and many are witnesses tonight, that it would come to pass that I would know the very secret of their heart. You remember that before it ever happened? About five or six years later, that taken place and up in Canada for its first time. And that happened. And then he said, if you'll keep being sincere, it'll just keep going. And now the third thing has taken place, see? just constantly moving on. And he said his father was brought into line and told of this epilepsy and so forth and a prayer, prayed for him. And that's been 16 years ago, I think it is, about 16 or 17 years ago. And he says he never has had a seizure of it since, and he's pretty 85 years old. Never had a seizure since. Amen. What is it? Jesus Christ. The same yesterday and forever. Is Margie Morgan in the building? Sister Margie Morgan, a lady that was eaten up with cancer, a nurse. How many remember Sister Morgan? If she's here, she can't get in. She was nursing, you see, on the cancer list in Louisville. The woman's been dead for about 16, 17 years on the cancer list in Louisville. When Jim Tom Robinson, the attorney, Christian attorney, heard about it, he went to the Baptist hospital to check and see if he's right because his father's on the board, trustee at the Baptist hospital. And they looked up the case, and the woman was supposed to have been dead years ago, and she's nursing here at the Jeffersonville in the hospital. When she stood right here, when they had to hold her up, not even in her own mind, but it was, Thus saith the Lord, Amen. and she's a living. She went to nursing in Louisville, and a fellow down here, Shimp's Candy Place. Is Mr. Shimp here tonight? I'd like for him to tell it if he's here. Sonny Shimp. Great healthy man. Many times, and I used to... I hate to say this, but it's the truth. Pop used to give me a dime uh, if I worked all week. And I'd come to town and park my bicycle around at Brother Mike Egan's place, one of the trustees here, with Jimmy Poole. I think his son is here tonight, Jim and I and Ernest Fisher. And we would go downtown and go to the picture show uh, for a nickel. And we used to see the old steel pictures with little kids and wanted about... Eight, ten years old, we had that William S. Hart. Many of you guys don't remember him, the old actor. Still pictures. Now, I couldn't read. I just had to watch what was going on. And uh, I had to spell it all out. And I couldn't make it, but I watched what he was doing. Now, I'd have an extra nickel. Now, how many remembers getting a penny ice cream cone? All right. I could get three ice cream cones and two pennies worth of Red Hots. I couldn't hold the ice cream cone, so I'd eat them and get me two pennies worth of Red Hots. to be almost a half a pound of them thing. And Shimps made him, and i go in there and sit back and watch William Asshart. And this young fellow, a little older than I, stricken down with a disease that five noted specialists of Louisville passed him by, weighing about 45 pounds, and was dying. Miss Morgan was nursing him, and he was in such a condition. Uh, he had so many things. His lungs was gone. His throat was gone. His little arms was just about that big around. And he was laying there dying. And Miss Morgan was hard to come on the job, so she said to him, uh, I was once the cancer patient, and began to tell him. He said, who would you say, Billy Brannan? Why, he said, I've sold him a many, a bunch of Red Hots <laughs> and ice cream cones. He said, wonder if he'd come pray for me. And I went over to pray for Junie um, uh, Shimp, and now if you'd like to talk to him, it's Shimp's Candy. Now you're right next door, a second door from Leo's Theater, down the street, Shimp's Candy. All of you here know where that's at. Mine's one of the oldest established in Jeffersonville. And 
while laying there dying with five specialists giving him just an hours to live, was thus saith the law. You'll not die, but you'll sell me again, red hot, Glory. over the counter. Glory. Long, I know he got well, but long had I forgotten that, and wife and I was going down to buy some candy when we got here at Christmas, and how I don't know that we ever thought of shims. Because usually you go over here to some of these drug stores and pick it up. But we stopped in front of Shims. When I went in, his sister looked and she said, Well, Brother Brown. She said, You remember Junie? I said, Yes. And there a great, big, strong, healthy looking fellow. And I walked toward the counter, looked at it, looked down like this. I said, I'll take a pound of those red hots. And uh, he said, Yes, sir. So his sister was waiting on my wife. And so he got him out. I said, I used to eat them a long time ago over here in the picture show. Keep my head down. And he said, yes. Yeah. I said, man, the kids buy that. They still buy it. I said, he said, my father made that, fixed up that farm. I said, I really like them. And I actually got all fixed out and handed to him. He says, anything else? And I said, I don't know. And raised up. <laughs> oh, my. He said, Brother Brown. I said, here's a red hot. said, I told you, thus saith the Lord. Amen. 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 About five years ago. He said, Brother Branham, I am so completely healed. Uh, there's not even one effect. I'm teeny bit hard hearing in one ear. I guess he's in his 50s. He said, I'm teeny bit hard hearing in one ear because they give me so much antibiotic when I was in there. The amazing grace of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now, I haven't got much time now to say something else, but I, I, I want to make this statement. How many remembers about the squirrels? <laughs> All right. That was a puzzling scripture in my life that I, I never could understand. That, and there was another that puzzled me. That's when Moses could tell God a better way than God knowed how to do anything. When Moses said, there are people who say your God was able to bring you out, but not able to keep you. And Moses threw himself in the breach. Then later I found out that Moses, that was Christ in Moses standing for the people. See? So then on this scripture, and I never would preach on it, if you say to this mountain, be moved. And you know the story. So I'll bypass that. Now, little did I know what that was leading to. And I think that Brother Woods and Brother Fred and them are here in the building which was present when that happened, or right after it happened there. Brother Rodney and Brother Charlie from down in Kentucky Sister Woods' brother and them was present when it happened down in Kentucky, which was the second time it happened. Just simply speaking into existence things that wasn't. See? Speaking all the time and backing up the Scriptures, encouraging. The third time it happened was Hattie Wright. Is Hattie here tonight? That's Edith. How many knows Hattie Wright? Brother Woods and I were sitting there when it happened. And when the Holy Spirit said, Give her what she wants. And I was talking about that. How did them squirrels come into existence? And I said, it's the only thing it is. He's Jehovah Jireh. Just when Abraham needed a ram, God provided that ram. And he provided the squirrels. He could speak a squirrel just into existence because he's creator, just the same as he could speak the ram. Abraham never asked for it. He was just simply going on to do it, but he showed that Jehovah Jireh was there. When I said that, a humble little woman, for the first time this ever happened, the third pull up on a human being was a little humble woman that making about $200 a year for a living, all she got out of her little farm, her husband dead, two children that had turned kind of wild, and come and donated $20 of that to the building of this tabernacle. And media gave me some money that morning for groceries, $20, and I was going to give it back to her that day while I was down there. So she wouldn't have to pay it, but she wouldn't take it. And when... She's sitting back in the corner, and when I said, only thing I know is he's still Jehovah Jireh, and little Hattie said the right word. She said, that's nothing but the truth. And when she said that, Brother Banks Woods, here's one that was present, that room felt like it was coming apart. And the Holy Spirit said, the same voice that spoke about the squirrel said, give her what she asked for. And I said, Sister Hattie, as a witness before God, this is it. Now, if there's any doubt in your mind, you ask what you want to, and if it ain't laid in your lap, then I'm a false prophet. She said, Brother Branham, everybody was crying. 
said, what shall I ask? I said, you're poor, and you live on the hill over there with no money. You might ask for that. You got a little crippled sister sitting here, Edith, that we prayed for for years. You might ask for her healing. I said, your father and mother is old and broke down. You might ask for them. Whatever you ask for, Sister Hattie, see now if it happens or not right now. And I said, he's just told me the same voice, said, give her what she asked for. And she looked around, she said, what shall I say, Brother Bram? I said, say what your desire is. Think of your greatest desire and say it. And her boys was even sniggering and laughing. And she said, the greatest desire I have is the salvation of my two sons. I said, I give them to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And there they went. And they've been faithful in this church with communion. And that little fellow sitting out washing feet with the man and things like that. We all are a witness of that. She had a real choice. Her mother has to die. So does she, all of them. But what she asked will be eternal. And the salvation of her children. That was the third time it happened. The fourth time it happened, I just explained it here the last time I was here, was up on the mountain where that storm raging. How many heard it? Oh, all of it. All right. Where the storm raging. And God being my judge standing here, going down the mountain when David Wood, he's here somewhere, I guess, that made me a sandwich. And it was quite a one. I think he's trying to get even with me for the one I made for his daddy a few years ago. He had bologna and and meat and everything mixed together. And I put it in my shirt and it rained and just got just a big wad of dough. And I was coming down the mountain. It's so stormy. I couldn't even see my hand before me hardly. And I know just one thing. You're turned around because that wind's just whirling. Now, there's witnesses here to that. One of them is one of our faithful deacons, which is Brother Wheeler. Are you here, Brother Wheeler? Where is he at? Uh, you're right here. Brother Wheeler. Brother Mann, a Methodist preacher from New Albany. Is he Brother Mann in tonight? Uh, don't know whether he is or not. Brother Banks Woods, are you here, Brother Banks? He's in the recording room. All right. And, um, and David Woods and uh, Brother Evans was there, I believe. Is that right, Brother Evans? Brother Evans, standing against the wall, was there. And how they broadcast for days, two days before that a mighty blizzard was sweeping the land. Brother Tom Simpson is here tonight. When coming down out of Canada, they asked him to bypass there because he couldn't get through. A blizzard was coming. Brother Tom, are you here? Where are you? Here he's sitting right here. And there the clouds come up, and I said, Brother, everybody rushed out. There was nobody back there out of a hundred and something men back there. There was nobody back there but our little group and the cowboy, the rider. And we was going to stay. I called Sister Evans and had her to call the wife and tell her to tell Tony if I didn't get out, get somebody else to hold the breakfast for the businessman. And up on the mountain that, that day, I said, Now, when it First, little rain starts or anything. Take for the camp. I said, within 10 or 15 minutes, you can't see your hands before you. Well, that blizzards. And it'll dump 20 foot of snow just in a little bit uh, over the mountain. And that's how people, you read it in the paper, how they're back there and perish and everything. But we knew how to get out, and they knowed where we was at. And so we felt led to stay. And um, so up on the mountain, when that blizzard started, I started going down. And I was just about a half a mile from where it started. And the voice of God said, turn and go back. And I went back, as he told me, after waiting for a while, eating that sandwich that David gave me, and went back up there and sat down. And while I was sitting there in that wind, twisting and blowing, the treetops leaning way over to sleet and snow, a flying like that, a voice said, I am the God of creation. I looked up and I thought, where was that? That was the wind, maybe. He said, I created the heavens and earth. I still the mighty winds upon the seas. And Went on talking. I jumped up and took off my hat. And he said, just speak to the stormer, and it'll cease. Whatever you say, that's what will happen. And I said, storm, you cease, and sun, you shine normally for four days till we're out of here. And I no more and said it until the sleet, snow, and everything stopped. In a moment or two, the hot sun is shining on my back. I seen the winds blowing like this, coming back from the north, coming down. I mean, from the east, coming from the east. It was coming from the west. The winds changed and come back this way, and the clouds like a mystic thing lifting up into the air, and the sun was shining in a few minutes. Then the Lord Jesus spoke to me a little later on about my wife down there, as you know, about where I went up there. I've never been home on an anniversary yet. We've been married 22 years. The first anniversary, the first our wedding. I, I took her on a hunting trip because I couldn't afford to take the hunting trip and uh, 
and, uh, and go on a honeymoon, too, so I, I kind of put it together. And so then, um, and I've been hunting ever since, and I felt the way I'd treat her. Now, that was the fourth time it happened. Now, here's something I, I want to say, and I must tell exactly the truth. About 16 years ago, I was in California with Brother John Sherritt. And I was having a meeting, and a meeting and I, and Brother Sherritt and Sister Sherritt and I was staying in a hotel, and a man named Paul Malikin, who stood right here in this tabernacle many times, he's a wealthy Armenian, and his wife had given birth to a child up at uh, Fresno, California, where they lived, and was come down, brought his wife down and called me at the hotel and said, can I bring my wife up, Brother Bram? I said, yes, you may. Next day, I was going to Catalina. So uh, they brought his wife up, and the little lady was so sick, and she, I said, put your hand on mine, Sister Maliki, and I said, we'll see if the Lord will tell us. And as soon as she laid her hands upon me, I said, oh, it's milk laying. She said, I don't seem to have any symptoms. I said, you watch. In two days, this doctor in her for milk laying. Like little Jimmy Poole here, his little baby, the other day come in with that heart attack they thought was an asthmatic attack. And I put my hand on him. I said, watch him for a couple of days. He's got measles. It's coming through. It's a fever. I met him last night. He said he broke out all over <laughs> and measles. See? Now, talking to Sister Malikin with a hand, she said, that's an amazing thing to watch that, Brother Brown. She said, does that work on every hand? I said, well, if there's something wrong with the patient. I said, now here, I put my hand on. Many of us stood and watched it, and it didn't do it. I said, here, there's nothing wrong with my wife. Put her hand. Look here, honey. Put your hand on mine. She's sitting there, my wife. She put her hand on mine. As soon as she did, I said, you have a cyst on the left ovary. You do have female trouble. And she said, I don't feel any different. I said, but you have it. Becky was two years old. My daughter that just played a while. She was two years old. Two more years, Sarah come on the scene. And when she is a Caesarean, and I asked Dr. Dillman, our doctor down in, in Carden, the, when you... I have her open, look at that left ovary. And he did. He said, nothing wrong that I saw. I put my hand, it's still there. Four years later come Joseph. I asked him, look again. Nothing wrong as I seen. Put my hand, it's still there. So we just forgot about it. Now, this is something that I have to say. I don't like to say it, but it just has to make the truth. See, and that's what you want. Always tell the truth no matter what takes place. Years had passed, we never noticed it. And I say this. Not because she's sitting there, because I say it when she's not there. You know that. I don't believe there could be a better wife in the world than my wife. And I hope she always remains that way. And I want to be a loyal husband. And I hope that every young man in this building, when he gets married, gets a wife like my wife. I don't know how long we'll live that way, but I hope the rest of our days on earth. We've been very happy together. God was the one who told me to marry her. At the same time, her not knowing, I was trying not to marry her. Not because I didn't love her, but because I didn't think I was able to make a living for her. And she's a fine woman, and I just didn't deserve that. And she went out to pray and opened up the Bible. And guess, she said, Lord, I've never did this before, but give me a scripture that will help me. If i got to forget him, I've got to forget it. Open the Bible. And she went out in a little shed and prayed. And when she opened the Bible up, Malachi 4, Behold, I send unto you Elijah the prophet. Before the... That was 20-something that was years ago, knowing nothing about the ministry of this day. And I was, couldn't believe, I was laying down the river there, and he wo woke me up one night. I heard him stand there at the door. He said, go get her, and your wedding shall be this coming October the 23rd. And that's just exactly what I did. And we've lived happy. By the grace of God, we've never had one word. She's been a sweetheart. One day I come in, and she's had to raise these children by herself. Me gone in the ministry. Not many women would put up with that. You know that. That'd be hard. And then, I come in and she said something. Right, we got Joseph back there, and he's a, he sure is a boy. <laughs> and he helped put some of the gray hair in his mother's head as well as I did. So he was a real all boy. And he had done something real bad, and I said to her, uh, she said to me, Bill, give him a licking. <laughs> I said, I just ain't got the nerve. See him. <laughs> and she said, Yes, if you had to put up with it. And she slammed the door right in my face. Well, I thought, that's all right. <coughs> Poor little fellow didn't mean that. I just went on out to wash my car. And when I got out there, the Holy Spirit didn't like it. He said, go tell her, I believe it's Second Chronicles, 22nd chapter. I, did, I, I thought, first I just imagined that. I just kept on washing. And it said it again, go tell her to read this. 
Now, when he got the Bible and read it, it was where Mo, or Miriam, the prophetess, made fun of her brother, Moses, for marrying an Ethiopian girl. And God didn't like it. And he said it been better that her father spit in her face than, than to have done that. So Miriam broke out with leprosy all over. And so Aaron come told his sister, said, or come told his brother, said, she's dying with leprosy. And so Moses run in to intercede for her at the altar. And when he did, the pillar of fire come down. God. He said, go call her and Aaron and bring him here. And Aaron was in it too. So he said, call him and come here. He said, if there be one among you, God speaking out of them, that spiritual or a prophet, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him. I'll speak to him in visions and reveal myself to him by dreams and, and reveal dreams and so forth. He said, but my servant Moses, there's none in the land like him. He said, I speak with him from lip to ear. He said, didn't you fear God? See, God didn't like it. Well, when I seen that, I run in and she was in the other room. I knocked on the door. She'd shut herself up. And I told her I want to speak to her. And I went in there and talked to her. Tried to tell her what it was. I said, sweetheart, you know how I love you. But God didn't like that. You oughtn't have said that. Immediately after that, she took a trouble in her side. We took her over to the doctor here in Louisville, Dr. Arthur Sheen, and he found a tumor on the left ovary that I'd found 15 or 16 years before. Tumor on the left ovary about the size of a walnut. I said, what about it, doctor? He said, let's see what happened. Bring her back again in a few months, about two months or something. We took her back. It had grown from a walnut to about the size of a lemon. It better come out. They get soft and turn malignant. And I said, well, ma, I said, we're, we're going to Tucson. The Lord has sent me out to Tucson. He sent her up to a female specialist. He didn't want it on his hands. So he must have told him about my ministry. Because he, um, the female specialist said it'll have to come out. So he said, we told him he was going to, to Tucson. He said, well, I've got a specialist there, a dear friend of mine who used to live in Tucson. He said, I'm going to send you to him. So he wrote a note and sent it to him and said, Miss Brenham's a nice lady and went on like that said, sent her the diagram of how big the tumor was and so forth. It turned tumor then. And said how big it was and said, I know, you know, you know I think he thought, called me a divine healer. That's all way he knew how to put it. But said, I have agreed that it could come out. It should, if it has to be taken out, take it out. But it's testing our faith. Constantly we prayed and more we prayed, the bigger the tumor grows. It got to a place that was sticking out on her side. We kept it quiet. A few of the people here knew it. Trying to see what would happen. On and on it went. Finally, when I come down from Canada, from where I let the Lord let me lead that tribe of Indians to Christ and going back to baptize them in the name of the Lord Jesus this spring, the Lord willing. Now, come down and it's time for her to go when I was in New York or down here to have another operation, to have the operation or be examined for the last time. I went on to New York, and when I come back, I stopped in here and went up. After I had the meeting here, the last meeting, I went up there and called her from Brother Woods, and she said, Bill, I can't even stand my clothes to touch it. It was just way out like this on her side then. And her leg on that side, she could just hobble along. The worst week she had ever had. Now, she's sitting there listening at me. The worst week she had ever had. And she said, I've got to go day after tomorrow for that examination. And I thought, oh, God. If they cut it out, that'll keep us from going home at Christmas. And I done told the people I'd be there. And I said, what a time. Oh, my. I thought, if, tell him if he's going to operate, well, let it go a little longer to, after Christmas. Then I got thinking it might be malignant. And back over here, you know, that's a bad thing. Run back into the kidneys. If it straight, uh, goes malignant, it'll kill you. So then I thought, what can I do? And immediately said, well, now, you call me. said, the day that I got in Shreveport, which would be the day after that, when I got in Shreveport, she had to go for the examination. And so she went to the, uh, uh, Miss Norman was going with Sister Norman. You, all of you know her, the people who come here at the tabernacle. She's going with her and to this specialist. And um, so uh, she said, wait till you have your first night at, at, and then come back because the difference two hours in time. Then call me when you come back to the meeting. I'll tell you what I've got to do. And I said, all right. So I went on. And the next morning before I left, I was going to get Billy and Lois. They're both sitting present. And always we got an old stool there that Brother Palmer covered for us here not long ago. And we always get around that stool and pray whenever we're old Ottoman-like, you know, footstool. Whenever we get around there and pray, when I'm going on a meeting, we ask God to help us. And I've been up there a couple of days, and I 
I was lonesome. The house, the kids gone, her gone. You know, many of you know I had to go through that one time, go back to an empty house. Only I buried that wife, Hope. And I it all over again. And I got down, I thought, well, I'll pray and then go pick up Billy and Lois and go on. So I just got down to pray. I said, Lord, I'm missing this morning around here. And I said, I pray that you'll help them and bless them. May we come back to this place again. And now I said, they're out there because that you sent me there on a vision and you fulfilled it. Now I'm wanting to wait to see what you're going to tell me to do next. I said, I pray for you. Be merciful to her. And I said, help me in the meeting down there. And then I kept, I said, Lord, don't let it be malignant. And let that doctor wait till after the first year to take it out. I, I just I hate to see her. I said, Lord, she didn't mean what she did that morning. She didn't mean that. I said, Lord, not one time has she ever said one word about me going to the meeting stand months or whatever it was. Not one time has she ever opened her mouth about it. She's always sent my clothes to the cleaners and washed my shirts and had everything ready to go in the meeting. And then she wonders how she could serve God. You women, as you serve your husband, you serve God, of course. And now, and then when I come in all tired and wore out, people coming from everywhere, I'd have to go out somewhere on a fishing trip or a hunting trip. Well, many women would have blowed up at that. What she do? Got my hunting clothes ready for me to go. Let me go. I said, Lord, she didn't mean that. Now I said, she's had to be cut open three times on account of she's to Syrian. And I said, I, I, Lord, I, I hate to see her have to do it again. And just then I heard something in the room. I looked up and a boy said, stand up. I said, now whatever you say, that's the way it'll be. Now wait just a minute. I said, before the doctor's hand shall touch her, the hand of God shall take the tumor away and it won't even be found. That settled it to me. I never called her. We went right on, went and got Billy and Lois, went to Shreveport. The next night I called her. She's happy. She said, Bill, I want to tell you. Now here she is and she can verify this. I had to hob her way over there, went in the room with the nurse and Miss Norman put her clothes on for the gown for the examination. The doctor came out and she could hardly get on the table. The tumor hanging up there so big. And when she, the doctor come in and was talking to her and he come over to raise back the sheet to touch her and just before he touched her, it left. <laughs> and the doctor didn't know which side it was on. He said, wait a minute. With the girl diagrams and all the pictures and everything else, he couldn't find one trace of it. He examined her over and over. He said, I might not be able to explain it, but Miss Branham, that tumor isn't there. Amen. And she's never had one symptom of it since. Amen. What was it? Notice, just exactly the way it's saying. Before Amen. the doctor's hand can touch it, Amen. one split second and his hand would have touched it. Amen. How perfect is the word of the Lord? Amen. Now there's my wife and we're both before God. But before the doctor's hand could even touch her body on the road coming to her like that, something happened. The tumor left. And they could he, he said, I believe it was when his sweetheart, I want to reassure you, Miss Brandon. Is that right the way he said it? That's right. That that tumor isn't there. Amen. You don't have any tumor. What was it? Just exactly according to the word Amen. of the law. Amen. That was voted. Amen. Amen. That's the fifth time. Five is a number of grace. A number of F-A-I-T-H-2. Amen. There's no more doubt in my mind. I know what the third pull is. And I know Amen. what it does. Now be reverent. Just keep quiet. The hour will soon arrive. <laughs> where God is going to do some great things for us. Amen. Now, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, I'd seen it upon other people, but when it come to my own precious wife, it was in my home then, Lord. I looked at it with my own eyes, felt it with my own hands, and I, 15, 16 years before that, it was also, Lord, known and revealed by you. When anything is spoken, it must be done. You were showing me, Lord, then that my confidence in what you had done for the people 
and would let me know so I could help them. You brought it to pass in my own home. That was the first pull. And now the third pull confirmed the first pull. We are thankful, Father. Forgive us of our shortcomings. We are a small people. We are uneducated, more or less than illiterate people. But we are so thankful that we have a great omnipotent God who watches over and cares for us, for we don't know how to care for ourselves. We commit ourselves to you. Now, Father, I pray that you'll help me. And in this third pull, may, O oh Lord, as you've been speaking for the last couple of years about it, showing it on marking on mountains and so forth and bring it on up. Now, I was watching to see what it was until it was completely confirmed. Now, I pray, Father, that you'll help me to be more reverent with this than it was before. And may you get glory as right over this same pulpit where the first was said, the second, and now the third. And what you have said has come to pass exactly what you said. We believe you, Lord God. Help every one of us to throw away our disbelief and our superstitions that we might stand in the presence of the living God, knowing that the same God that took Amen. that tumor from my wife that's sitting present now, verified by some of the highest medical science we got in the country, yes. who examined it and then looked and pictured it, and now it's gone. You are God, Amen. and there's none other besides you. And we love you because that you have, you have let us become your servants. And may we serve you with reverence and honor all the days of our life. Grant it, Lord. May I be able, and my family, and all these people be able yes. to be shining lights, salty salt, that will create a thirst in others to love this Jesus that has done so much for us. Now, as I open the Word to read it for our little text, and then pray for the sick, help me, Lord, speak to us, and heal the sick. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Would you, have I got time? Well, just for, if I hurry real quick on a, some texture, I want you to read now, or mark down, or whatever you wish to do. The first one is found in the book of Numbers 21, 5 to 19. And um, we want to, to read this. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our souls loath this light bread, angel's food. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the Lord, therefore the people came to Moses and said, Confession, watch, we have sinned. That's the first thing for healing, confession first. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, that it shall become, come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh, Upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, also, I wish to read a scripture out of Zechariah, the twelfth chapter, the tenth verse. And I will pour out upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Now, for a text, I'm going to take this. Look away to Jesus. Look away from the world to Jesus. 
Moses made the serpent, and here the prophet later was speaking of it, what would happen looking away to, to Jesus? The Bible said in Isaiah 45, 22, we find that God said, Look unto me all the ends of the earth. And now, when the earth has come to its end, or the system of the earth has come to its end, let the people look unto him. Now, you might say, we have heard this generation after generation. We've heard this for a long time. Well, that is true. And it's been preached for a long time. Many ministers have talked this same text, thousands of them. But here is the thing I want to ask you tonight for these next few minutes. But when you look, the question is, is what do you see when you look? What do you see when you do look? That only depends on what you're looking for. Okay. Now, I said, look unto me all the ends of the earth. Moses lifted the serpent up, and everyone who looked got healed. Now, it depends on what you're looking for. I've seen people come into the meetings in this last day, could only be able to sit in the meeting for just about one or two minutes. That's all they could stand. See? They couldn't stand it. i never forget. I hope this don't reflect on anybody from Iowa. When I had the meeting at Waterloo, Brother Lee Bale, he was here this morning. I don't know where he's here tonight or a year, Lee. Um, uh, he was here this morning. Oh, yes, back over in the recording back here. All right. Brother Lee and I done everything we could and give the ministerial association a breakfast free just to come down and speak to them. Brother Lee Vale, of course, is a scholar and, and a, a doctor of divinity and he really earned his degree. And so I tried to get him to speak before these Lutheran Presbyterians and so forth, but he said, no, they're looking to you to do it. Well, I went out and took my text before these ministers after they all got through eating. I took my text. I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. No more than I'd read the scripture, about two look out the door they went. <clears throat> so as I started to say, as Paul in his day with an odd ministry, and now he stands before Agrippa and said that he wasn't disobedient to it, about two or three more got up. And by the time I got to where I could say something about the text, it was just about three or four sitting there. That all got up and gone. The reason of it is, is this, some come to a meeting when they hear of an evangelist, the way he dresses has something to do with the people. If he don't wear the right kind of clothes, some of them, I heard a, a psychologist say the other day, Dr. Naramore, a fine man, Christian man, his programs don't care there all the time. He said, the way to tell that a man was losing his mind is when he didn't dress according to to his uh, disposition, you know, to how he has to appear before the public. That was a sign that he was losing his mind. Well, then I've been crazy all my life then, see? Because I wear overalls and everything, see? So, fitting to my position, I must dress like a clergyman, in other words, uh, to be a clergyman. I don't think Jesus dressed like a clergyman. He dressed like an ordinary man. He went in among men and there was nothing dressing. But that's just see how... That the idea is a man. It doesn't. How about if this man? Well, I wonder what the doctor would think of this. When a prophet in the Bible was commanded to strip off his clothes and walk naked before the people, he really would have been crazy, wouldn't he? Now, but God told him to do it. Another one had to lay on his side for 340 months. I believe it was laying on his side. One side, then turned over the other side. And he'd a pot of lentil that he had made there, had to go and see this stuff and make it up together, and eat it all that time, reach over and get a handful and eat, laying on his side for a sign. Hmm? Oh, how far people can get from really the Word of God. Yeah. They just get so educated till they educate themselves away from God. Yeah. When a man talks about he's got an education, I know that's just how far he is from God. Yeah. See? A doctor's degree, not saying this against Dr. Vale, because he is in that type. But... Uh, usually when a man gets a doctor's degree, that just means to me he's that much farther from God. See? Unless he can hold himself to the Word and to God. Now, we find out that some comes to hear the way you speak. When they come to look, you talk about divine healing and the Lord 
if a man isn't typical, an educated genius, that people just can't stand to hear him use words as his and hate and, and words like that. They just, they don't, they think that, that's way away from God. And when Jesus spoke such simple language, until the day it's got the professors confused. For they tried to interpret it according to the scholarships and the language of that day, and it was street language. Therefore, why there's so much difference even here in our United States. I called from Florida to New York and had to get a woman at, over here to at, um, St. Louis to translate between this southern girl and the northern girl. <laughs> That's how much difference there was. See? Certainly. Now, the thing of it is that people look for those things, speeches. And instead of the Word, the Word being manifested is the evidence that it's right. Amen. See? The Word being manifested. They'll never look at that. You've got to have an intellectual conception to know, go to the seminary and learn how to bow, how to stand in one place. and all, all That would choke a minister to death that was really filled with the Holy Spirit. See? Now, that's intellectual. And that's the way that this whole nation has got, it's got an intellectual conception of Christ. That's what they look for. And if Christ is in you, you've got to be a scholar. You've got to be an intellectual, because that's what they think Christ is. And another time, another thing, they form their own opinions what he ought to be. Amen. Their own idea, instead of taking what the Word said. Yes. That's the way when they look and even see Jesus himself, they fail to recognize him. Amen. They did it on the day of Pentecost. They did it when he was in flesh. They did it when he was in the manger. They did it when he was on the streets of Jerusalem. They did it when he was on the cross. And he was the fulfillment of that word. And yet they had the Messiah coming down on a carter out of heaven and everything else. And was wrong because it was their intellectual conception and they failed to see him. And looking right at him. So is it today. What do you see when you look? Some look to see... When they look at him, they look to see some great intellectual church founder, somebody who can really produce a creed that will cause all the people to fall for this creed. Something or another, that's what they look when they see. Some look to see a myth, like Santa Claus, when they look, they read the Bible and say, oh, that's a mythical thing. It's just something that man wrote. That's what they cause when the what opinion you take of the Bible is what you take of him. See? Some look to see a baby. Some look and see a, a rabbit or a Santa Claus. Some look to see some historical book that was yesterday and not today. But the question is, what do you see when you look? So many of you that claim to have the Holy Ghost look and see the second person of a trinity. Amen. When it's not even mentioned in the Bible, there's no such a thing. The word Trinity is not even in the lids of the Bible. Amen. But yet when you look at Jesus, you regard him as the third person or the second person of a Trinity. And that's the reason you're going to get nowhere. Amen. You know what he said? I am God. And there's none other besides me. Amen. Depends on what you're looking at. If you want to put some little mascot boy, an old man with beard and so forth, if that's the way you look at Jesus as being a, some different person from God, you're looking wrong. Amen. You don't see it. Here not long ago, I had a pair of field glasses. I was trying to watch some antelope or an antelope over in the field. And my son was trying to show me. He's quite a bit younger. So he said, take them glasses, Daddy. There stands the antelope right out there. I said, I can see him with my natural eye. He said, take these glasses. When I looked, I seen about ten antelopes. But the glasses was out of focus. And when I went to focus them in, all ten of them become one. Yes. And if you focus your mind yes. to God's Word, the three will be one. Yes. Yes. But your ecclesiastical glasses get out of focus. Yes. When you try to make him three, he's one. Yes. But it depends on what you are looking at. What do you see when you do look? Remember, you can only see him as you look at him through the Word. You can't look at him through a textbook. You can't look at him through a creed. You'll see two or three gods and everything else in them creeds. But look at him through the Word. Amen. And you'll see that he is Emmanuel. Amen. 
God made flesh among us. He said, I'm God, and besides me there's none other. He's God. Isaiah looked one time, the prophet, and when he seen Jesus, my subject is looking to Jesus, look away to Jesus. When Isaiah looked away from the world to see him, he said, I see a counselor, a prince of peace, the mighty God, the everlasting Father. That's what Isaiah looked away and saw. Daniel one time was standing when he saw the, the ending of the Gentile kingdoms. He saw the image that Nebuchadnezzar had dreamed. He saw how each one would succeed the other as they come down. And when he looked to see what was all going to happen at the end, when he saw Jesus, he was a stone. You dial him out without hands that crushed the Gentile kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar told three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace that believed in God and stood on his word. If they had to die for it, they'd go to stand anyhow. Just a little thing of bowing their knees some other way. But when he looked away and saw Jesus, he was the fourth man that was in the fiery furnace. And it kept all the heat off of his obedient servants. That's what Nebuchadnezzar saw. Ezekiel looked away to see him one day, and he was a wheel in the middle of the wheel, way up in the middle of the air. He was the hub to the wheel, wherever spoke is fastened to. Amen. The big wheel run by faith, but the little wheel turned by the power of the Lord. That's who Ezekiel saw when he looked away. John the Baptist looked away one day, and when he did, he saw a dove and a voice saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm pleased to dwell in. Yeah. That's what he saw. Then he saw Jesus and God being the same person. Because the Spirit come down from heaven like a dove saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm pleased to dwell. That's what he saw. Notice, he identifies himself in that way. Noah, when he looked away to see him, Noah saw the just judgments of God coming upon a people of this world who had rejected his word. That's what Noah said when he looked away. Moses, when he looked away, he saw a bush on fire. A pillar of fire had brought itself back into a bush. And when Moses drew close to it, he said, Take off your shoes, for I am. Now, if you'd weigh that word, I am. It's past tense, present tense, and future tense. I am eternal. See, I am. He saw the I am. That's what he saw in the burning bush. Israel looked at the brass serpent that Moses made and saw the suffering of Christ for the judgment for the sick. For we know that the serpent spoke of the atonement. Jesus was that atonement. As Moses lifted up the brass serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up for the same purpose. See? Why? They had sinned and they got sick. That was for the taking away their sins and for their sickness. And that's what Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. Take divine healing away from Christ, you cut half the atonement in two. See? What do you see in him when you look? Do you see that? Do you see that he was wounded for our transgressions? With his stripes we were healed. When you look away, can you see that? Or can you just see one side of the atonement? Can you see both sides of it when you look? If you look at it through the creed, they'll tell you the days of healing is past. But if you look at it through the Word, you'll see He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The disciples looked to Him when they were in a troubled sea, and they saw the only help that could help them coming. Martha looked to Him in a time of death. And she saw that he was the resurrection and the life. Amen. 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 In time of death, Martha saw when she looked at him, he had been rejected by her people. He had been turned down. Even she had sent for him, and he did not come to her brother. But when finally he come, and she went and fell down so she could look at him, she found out that he was both resurrection and life. Amen. Amen. Jairus did the same thing, a secret believer, a little Presbyterian Methodist Baptist that really believed but couldn't get around on account of his denomination wouldn't let him because 
He'd be excommunicated. But his only little daughter lay at the point of death. And he had to go. But when he found him, he found out that he was a resurrection in life. Amen. When he sent for him, a runner come and said, Don't trouble the master, for the girl is already dead. He, and his little heart almost failed, but he said, Did not I say, if you'll only believe, you'll see the glory of God? Yes. Drys found out that he could raise up the dead. Amen. When he looked at Jesus, the hungry looked to him and found sustaining food for life. That was natural. The hungry spiritual can look to him and find out he's the bread of life. Amen. The dying thief looked to see what he could see, and he, found, and he found in Jesus his pardon. Remember me, Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That's what he saw in the hour of his death. The sick looked to him and saw the healer. The blind looked and could see. Depends on what you're looking at now. What do you look? Peter and Nathaniel looked and seen the promised word of their prophet Moses made manifest. Amen. The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. And to him the people shall cling. And all that don't believe him, and here that prophet will be cut off from the people. And when Peter walked up into his presence, Jesus said, Your name is Simon. And you are the son of Jonas. He knew right then when he looked the first time on Jesus that there was a fulfillment of what the Word of God said he'd be. Amen. I wonder if you found the same thing when you looked at him for the first time. I wonder if the promised Word manifested itself to you when you looked at him. Nathaniel, as soon as he come into the presence of Jesus, a little bit in doubt, we find out that Philip had went and told him, Come see who we found. And Nathaniel come, and he said, Which one is he? He said, Probably it's the one up there praying for the sick. He pressed his way through to you, get a look at him. And when he looked, Jesus said, Behold an Israelite, in whom there's no God. He said, Rabbi, when did you ever know me? He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Then what did Nathaniel find? He found out that there was the king of Israel. He said, Thou art the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. That's what he saw when he looked. He got the interpretation of the Scripture brought to light before him. He saw it. The same Scripture that the anointed prophet Moses had said, He will be a prophet likened unto me. The woman at the well. She got a look one time. And what did she see? She expressed it in the city. She said, Come see a man who told me the things I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? When she took her first look at Jesus Christ, she saw the Messiah. People can look at the same thing today and call it mental telepathy. They'll call it spiritualism. They'll call it any kind of a devil name they can call it. Because they don't know what they're looking for. Amen. Amen. They don't understand. They're looking for a creed. They're looking for a genius to set the church in order. They're looking for more members and fail to see the blessed Lord Jesus Christ in His identified Word. Amen. Right. Depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for the fulfillment of the promise of today, you'll see it. But if you're looking for some intellectual, or something that they've always looked for, some great founder, some historian, some other person, something else, you'll fail to see it. But when you look at him through the Word, Amen. the Word declares who he is. Amen. He challenged the people of his days to do the same. They couldn't see him. He said, you blind leaders of the blind, you claim Moses to be your prophet. If you would know Moses, you would know me. Amen. Moses wrote about me. Yes. And they were too blind to see it. Looking right at it. And too blind to see it. I'm dovetailing that glare this morning for a few minutes, you see. They're looking and don't know what they're looking for. Because they've got the wrong conception of what you're trying to find. How would you know what you wanted to find if you didn't know what you was looking for? How would you go hunt for a pumpkin and you never seen one and never heard of one? How would you go find a watermelon if you never know there was such a thing and how it looked? 
Why, you could find a tub and think it was a watermelon. You could find something else. You could find a block and think it was a watermelon. But you've got to know what you're looking for. Amen. And the only way that you'll ever know what you're going to, what you're looking for, if you're looking for Jesus, you'll look to the Word, for He is the Word. Amen. They are they that testify of me. Search the Scriptures. Yeah. You claim you are the believers of the prophets, but you're your father the devil. Your fathers who claim when God sent the prophets to him, he put them in the grave. They, they kill the prophets. Every one that come, Jesus said. Which one of them your fathers didn't stone? And the works of your father you'll do. Amen. Hey, man. Righteous man. Holy man. A man that you couldn't put a finger on. And yet he called them serpents and devils. Hmm? What are you looking for? If you're looking for some pious person, some people think that because the Holy Spirit would work to you, you'd have to be some long, pious Feller walk around and not even... That's not the Holy Spirit. God don't deal through angels like that or supposed to be. God deals through man. The Bible said Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. But you couldn't be with him until you seen Jesus. Peter and John at the gate called beautiful. And when they pulled him up there about healing that man, they had perceived that they were ignorant, unlearned but they also perceived that they had been with Jesus. Amen. Because his life was reflecting through them. Now, depends on what you're looking for. The woman had read the Bible. She knew there was a coming Messiah. And she knew what that Messiah would do. And as soon as Jesus said to her, bring me a drink, she said, it's not customary. He's just an ordinary man. Now, if he'd been sitting there with a great big turban on and all kinds of ornaments over him of, of some holy person, well, the woman had said, well, there's a priest, and went on. Or there's some kind of a rabbi, went on. Minister, something or another, I've seen a man come to eat today where I went to eat. And that fellow come in, he, he had enough crosses and things on him. <laughs> it's a good thing sometimes them fellows had that. <laughs> I think you ought to live a life. You don't have to have a lot of clergy clothes to prove what you are. Amen. Sometimes they drink and carry on so much and smoke cigarettes. Amen. And everything, they have to wear clergy clothes to even know whether they're a minister or not. That's right. I tell you, the clergy clothes for a man to wear is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That'll identify you as being with Jesus. Amen. Now, we find out that it depends on what you're looking for. A well-dressed, real groom, some kind of a turban, you'll never see him because he was just an ordinary man. God deals with man. Jesus was a man. God was in the man, and he was God. Now, we find out that this woman, when she saw this mysterious sign that he could tell her what she had done that was wrong or what was on her heart, she knew right then that was the Messiah. So when she looked at Jesus, she saw the Messiah. Amen. The Messiah. What was the works of the Messiah? We know the secret of the heart. Amen. Did that catch you right? Amen. I wonder if you'll understand. If you look for him tonight, what would you look for? He'd be the same. The Messiah is the Word. Amen. The Word. And the Bible said in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, that the Word of God is quicker, more powerful than a two-edged sword, cutting even to the son or bone, and a discerner of the thoughts that's in the heart. Amen. And when she knew that Messiah was to be that Word made manifest and could tell her what was wrong with her, she knew that was Messiah. Amen. Not how he's dressed. Amen. Not how much education he had. But by the sign that he showed her, he was Messiah. When she saw Jesus, she saw the Messiah, God in a man, as promised uh, for that anointed age. But you know what? Many of them same age that I have spoke of never seen that thing. Many of them didn't see it. Same today. Many didn't recognize Moses. Many didn't recognize Elijah. Many didn't re They never recognized him. Till they're gone, Amen. then they recognize it. Amen. The unbelievers seen in the days of Noah, only, what did the unbelief look at? I've told you what the believers saw. Now let's see what the unbelievers saw. In the days of Noah, what did the unbelievers saw? See back there when they looked. They saw a fanatic blundering around on a so-called boat. <laughs> That's all they saw. Some crazy old man with long white whiskers that had lost his mind 
and against scientific research and proof that there's water up there. Well, a poor old fellow, they felt sorry for him. Passed him by. He'll be declared insane soon. He's lost his mind. But he had the word of the Lord. Amen. He was building away on it, and God was showing evidence that the flood was coming. It was a sign to them. Them who did not believe Noah's story wandered on into darkness and ended up in a death in the water and a grave of hell. Pharaoh, he looked one time. What did he saw? Why well, saw Pharaoh? He seen a fanatic so-called prophet with many so-called claims of deliverance. That's all he saw. A mud dauber, a slave standing up amongst the people and saying himself was sent of God to perform miracles. While they thought the fellow had lost, said, go let him rave on. He'll be able to claim the insane after a while. But he had thus saith the Lord. Amen. The believers, Aaron, Joshua, and many of them seen God in Moses. And the works of God Moses done. That's the reason they know God was in him. They looked and saw God in Moses. The rich man looked and seen exactly who he was. See? But he refused to follow him. Because he loved the things of the world too much to follow Jesus. How many rich men? Well, listen to this tape of that type. Don't have to be always rich in money. No, you can be rich in lust, rich in pleasures of this life. How many men, how many young girls, how many young boys will not sell out their popularity of some sex queen or some Ricky with a banjo or guitar going out entertaining some rock and roll or some dance that he's able to do? How many of them will claim that riches of popularity? and refuse when they sit right in the meetings and watch the hand of God move and declare His Word. Amen. How many will do it? He chose His denomination. He could live by it. Jesus was a fanatic to His denomination, so He had to either take what Jesus said, or either He had to take... Why didn't He go to His priest and say, What can I do to have eternal life? He knew the priest know nothing about it. Amen. So He come to Jesus and said, What can I do? Jesus said, Keep the commandments. Put it right back in His lap. He said, I've done this. He said, keep the commandments. Then he still didn't have eternal life, and he knew he didn't. Amen. You can keep all the commandments, and you haven't got eternal life yet. Amen. So Jesus said, now, if you want to do what's right, go sell what you got and give it to the poor. Come follow me. Amen. That was too much for him, see. We find out that he looked and seen who he was, but yet refused to take it, and his next look was in hell, yeah. looking away up and seeing Lazarus in the bosoms of Abraham. Pilate looked one time. When they brought him, he'd never seen him before. His hands tied. Blood running out of his back. A crown of thorns on his head. Pilate looked and was convinced. Because a horse come galloping down the street and a, a rider jumped off and run over and said, Here's a wife has sent you a letter. And he looked at it and she said, Pilate, my beloved husband, have nothing to do with that just man. For today I've suffered many things in a dream because of him. He trembled, his knees beat together. And he said, if you are the Son of God, if you're the King, why don't you speak out? Are you the King of Israel? He said, you have said it. Amen. <laughs> he said, tell us truth. He said, to this end I was born. And Pilate marveled. He, all everybody was begging and crying at his feet. He said, I have power to kill you or I have power to release you. He said, you have power of nothing unless it be given to you of my Father. Amen. Sir, he was convinced that that was more than a man. He was thoroughly convinced that it was more than a man. Certainly he was. But what? His politics and popularity was too great. See, he turned him down. His popularity was too great. The politics, his position in life was too great to accept this fanatic. Wonder how many pilots will be listening to this. That your position in some denomination will be too great to accept the real Lord Jesus. Standing in the position that he is today. The Roman soldier at the cross looked on Jesus. After the earth had had a nervous prostration, shook to the rocks, wrung out of the mountains, and the sun went out in the middle of the day and turned dark. The stars didn't come out to give its light. 
in the earth burst forth with rocks and an earthquake. And the zigzag lightning swept the skies and ripped the temple to veil from the top to the bottom. And the people running and screaming, they didn't know what had taken place. And that Roman soldier that helped nail him there had punched the sword to his heart. Then he looked, but it was too late. He looked and believed, but it was too late for him to believe. What he had done had sealed his doom. He had run the spear through the Savior's heart. It was too late. I wonder how many Romans today has done the same thing and will do the same thing. You might look someday, but it might look too late. Many of today will come in that day and be the same way. They have known, Brother Woods here yesterday, saying this is because it's in this message. Down here at the slider company, a Roman Catholic sitting there. He went out and get some concrete for the church here. And when he did, he told him where he wanted for. And the Roman Catholic said, is that Brother Branham? Yes. He said, I'll say one thing. When he prays, God answers. See? Amen. Wonder then, knowing it, yeah. seeing the vindication Amen. that is truly the gospel, not me, any man right. representing Christ. It's a word we're talking about, not man. What am I trying to say is this. That they see the clearly a vindicated word like Pilate and the rest of them did. Yeah. Like the Roman soldier. But are you going to wait too late to do anything about it? Yeah. You should have used the spear the other way. The doors will be closed like it was in the days of Noah. And then it's too late. You might wake up some morning and say, I intend to get out of this mess. Don't wait too long. You better look and live now. Luther looked away from the Catholic denomination. What did he see? A pillar of fire. He saw an independent church. Wesley looked away from the Anglican denomination. He saw the same thing. The Pentecost looked away from all the denominations. What did he become? A great mighty people. What did each one of them do? When the founders, Luther and Wesley, and them, and when they looked away and saw what they did to start out, their children coming behind them looked back to where they come from out of the denomination and tuck that group of people right back into the same mess that they come out of. Amen. What are you looking at? The founders look right, but the people following them look back to what the founders come out of and done exactly what the founders was against, the anointed ones of God. You know, I got to hurry because I got a prayer line coming and how many of has to travel. One day I took a look. I saw the Word made flesh. I saw the Alpha and Omega. I never seen any three, four, five. I saw one. I saw Him as my Savior. I saw Him the Word. I saw Him the life. I saw Him the mighty God. I seen God in Him. I saw the pillar of fire. I saw in Him exactly what the Bible said He was. I saw that He was the Alpha and Omega. That He was the pillar of fire. He was the same yesterday and forever. I saw that the pillar of fire said to John, his never failing presence, as he said in John, uh, over there, his never failing presence will never leave you. Brother, my opinion tonight, sing that song, look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live, for it's recorded in his word, hallelujah. It's only that you look and live. Look, what do you see? Do you see deliverance? Do you see what he is? Look through the Word and see what He was. Then you look through the same Word and see He's the same today as He was then. He is the antitype of the brass serpent in the wilderness for the same cause, sin and sickness. Judas took a look one day. And when he looked after he had took a real look at him, he'd only been looking at the treasure before that, the pot of money they had. But one day when he looked and seen Jesus, you know what he's seen? He's seen he was guilty. He's seen that he wasn't fit to live, and he hung himself. One morning, one of the greatest mornings in the all history of time, in closing, I'm saying this. There's something happening in Jerusalem, and all at once a bunch of soldiers came down to the, to the jail. I hear the jingle of the, the chains. I hear the dragging of the spear on the street. Who's back in there? Barabbas. He's ready to die. He's a thief. He's no good. He's a robber. He's a murderer. He's going to die. First thing you know, he said, well, this is all of it for me. I'll be executed this morning. 
And the first thing you know, the guard opened the door. Step out, Brabus. He stepped out and said, well, I guess this is the end. He said, Brabus, you're absolutely free. What? I'm what? I'm absolutely free. You're free, I said. He said, how can I be free? He said, well, come here, Brabus. Look up there. You see that man dying up there? He took your place. I wonder if we all tonight could look and see what Brabus saw. Someone taking our place. He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, and with his stripes I was healed. You were healed. Wonder if we, the guilty ones who should be sick, can see in him our deliverance. You who should go to hell, see in him your freedom, your path to heaven. Wonder if you can see what Brabus saw on that day. He said, A little while, and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me. Oh, church, then if he said, you shall see me, it's proof that you can look again. Amen. You'll see me, for I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Why, how do you see him? At the Word. Amen. He is the Word. Look at the Word and see what the promise is. For he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he was when he walked in Galilee is the same thing he is tonight in Jeffersonville. The same thing he is at the Branham Tabernacle. What do you look to see? A founder? A denominational man? You'll never see it in Jesus. Do you look to see some great priestly? You'll never see it in Jesus. No. How do you see Jesus? By the Word of God being made manifest because he was the manifested Word of God. What he was then, he is tonight and will be forever. Let's bow our heads just a moment. I'll cut this off kind of short. Lord Jesus is my prayer. Let me look away from the cares of life. Lord, I, I know we're just a common people, uneducated. We have not much of this world's goods, but we love you, Lord. And I speak for this people. They would not sit in a place like this and squeeze and mash and around in the crowds and sit burning up in the the heat are freezing in the cold and standing there and bringing their children and them sick and the afflicted coming around if they come here to see anything else besides you. Those people, Lord, would never come to see a man. There's plenty of men on the street. They all look alike. But they come to see that man, that man of God, that Jesus of Nazareth of flesh being God. Now, Father, you have told us that a little while and the world would not see no more. No matter how much they look, they'll never see it. But you said, ye shall see me, the true believer, because I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. You promised us if we looked, we would see. And I pray tonight that you'll fulfill that scripture to us again tonight, that we might look and see Jesus making himself known to us in the same way that he always has, fulfilling his word. From henceforth, Lord, and I made a statement before this, and I've truly said these things from my heart about the pools, and you told me, and now, as mysterious as it may seem, if we could only pinch our inner conscience and see that those things could not be foretold, perfectly as they are, unless it did come from God. How could we see that first thing take place? How could the second take place? How could the third take place? How could we stand here months before it happened and tell what would take place in Tucson and would open up seven seals and bring back the mystery and reveal the hidden things of God that's been hid since the beginning of time? And to see it both testified, witness scientifically proven. Lord, you're our refuge and strength. You're all that we have. And I thank you for, Lord, being a part of this great economy of yours. I thank you for being a member of your body, along with many here who are members of that body, many all out through the world in different churches that are members of that mythical body of Christ. Every time we look, we see him. See him when the birds sing. See him when the sun rises or when it sets. 
hear him in the songs, watch him and his people, see him vindicating his word. Oh, Lord, you are our God. Early will we call upon thee. Thou art our merciful Father. Forgive us of our wrongs. Lord, we are at the end time. I see the doors will soon be closed, the doors of opportunity. And while it is daylight and I can still get into some of these places, Lord, help me to go. I'm getting old. Give me strength. Renew my youth, Lord. Help me that I might do something out there now that I'm waiting for this great time to come that we'll be here. Help me, Lord, as I go out that I might be able under some way to catch that last predestinated seed that will bring back the Lord Jesus. Help, oh God. And if I'm laying a foundation that another shall stand upon, grant, Lord, that soon it'll happen, that the word might be fulfilled. Our heart's desire is to see your word fulfilled. We love you. We believe you. In the midst of an unbelieving, doubting people, a generation of, of, of what we got today, Lord God, we still believe that your word will never fail. We believe that heavens and earth will pass away, but it shall never fail. We stand gallantly for that. Now, Father, to this little group that's waited, there's many sick in here, and there may be a unsaved in here, people that have been saved and yet hasn't been filled with the Holy Ghost. Lord God, may you come so on the scene by your word of promise that the people will look and see Jesus and then bow down and give their hearts to him. May the sick look and see that it's impossible for anything else to be doing it, only God, because it is His Word promise. What we have said today, both messages, may it be confirmed now. It's all in your hands, Lord, and I'm in your hands, and the, the congregation's in your hands. Work through us, Lord, to honor your great name. O oh, Eternal One, grant this for the glory of God. Amen. I know it's hot. And I want to try to pray for the sick now. And if you'll just give me about 15, 20 minutes. I don't know how many cards they got to give out, but we're just going to start and pray for the sick. Now, uh, Billy told me that he'd give out... What was it? Uh, what the... What? All right. Well, let's start... Um, uh, he said he'd give out from one to a hundred. How many has prayer cards? Here, raise up your hands. Prayer cards. Which is quite a number. We're trying to get to everything that we possibly can if we can. Now, we can't have discernment on all of them, you know, so we'll just pray. And everybody, how many here doesn't have a prayer card and yet you're sick? Raise up your hand. Many. Now, look. What is it? Now, I know we may be a, a teeny bit late off of schedule, about 15 minutes. But I want to say this one thing. It might be the difference between here spending eternity in heaven or hell. See? Look. Be reverent. Watch a minute. Listen at the Word and see if He still remains Christ. Now, every person here probably knows me. And many of you I don't know because I don't get here long enough to know you. And many of you are out of town. How many out of town people raise your hand? See? Now, I asked somebody downtown the other day. I said, you ever come up? He said, there's no need of us coming. <laughs> he said, there's so many from out of town. Get there. We can't get in. But that's, that's okay. We'll fix a way for them to get in. You come anyhow. Notice, they had a chance before you did. Amen. 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 Now, remember, now, I am just your brother. I assure you understand that. I am a man. He is God. But God only can work and always has worked and only worked through man. Now, look tonight, not to me or to any other person, but look to Jesus Christ. Now, look tonight at the Scripture, what it promised. How many of you, I can just give all kinds of Scriptures, but how many will just believe Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday? And how many believe John 14, 12, the works that I do shall you also? Amen. How many believe that he promised that the very things that he did in the way of discerning the thoughts in the heart would return again in the last days just before he's coming? Amen. We all know it. All right. Oh, how many more? Hundreds and hundreds of scriptures. But we know it. Now, look. Don't look to see a minister. Don't look to see a pastor. Look to see Jesus. Amen. Don't see the man. See Jesus. When you look, see him. If I could help you, I would do it, but I can't. I can't help you. 
I'm just your brother, but he's your Lord. Look to him and believe. All right? Now let's start with prayer card number... Well, let's start from number one. How many... Number one. Who has prayer card number one? Raise your hand. Where is it? You mean your... You mean your... Was that... Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Number one. Come up here, lady. Right... Which way you want to bring him? This way? Or come right here. If, if you can walk. If anybody's calling out, it's crippled. Uh, some of us help bring you up. Number one. Number two. Who has prayer card two? Raise your hand. Quickly as you can. Number two. Where is it? I don't see it. Where? I'm sorry. I, I can't. Right over here, lady. Number three. Would you stand up or something? That's right. Number three. Number four. Prayer card number four. Would you raise your hand? Where is it? I don't see it. Prayer card number four. What say? Number four. Number five. Who has number five? Would you raise your hand? I don't see it. Number five. Number six. Number six. Quickly. Right quick. Number six. All right. Seven. You, seven. All right. That's right. Eight. Eight. Real quick now. Raise up right quick. All right. Eight. That's fine, sir. Nine. Nine. Where's that? Number nine. All right. Number ten. Ten. All right. Ten. Right over here. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Thirteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. They won't call too many, so you get... See, the reason we do this, it's just a card with a number on it. See? And you just come with this number that keeps them lined up. Fifteen. Prayer card. Fifteen. All right. Sixteen. Seventeen. Eighteen. Nineteen. Twenty. Twenty-one. Twenty-two. Twenty-three. Twenty-four. Twenty-five. Let them come line up now. Twenty-five. You get your line built up. Just get up now according to your numbers. That's right. Don't come all at once. Come around the other way, if you will, if you're out that way, and come. Now... 20, what do we call it, 25? 25. All right. Let, let's rest on 25 just for a minute. All right. Now, Isaiah, if you don't want to stand too long, when you see that coming down, then you get right in with them. 25, 26, 27. Just, well, wait, let the line get down. A little. You won't have to stand too much, uh, too long. Now, let's bow our heads. Oh, friends. Now what? Now, where are we at? Now we're at the, the end. We're at the time where something has to be done. Said yes or no. God's got to be found right or wrong. Uh, today I preached two sermons hard, trying to tell you what he is. Tell you the time is closing. What he is, what he was. And now when we look tonight, let's look at him. Now every person in the name of the Lord Jesus, keep your seat now, don't stir around. Sit real still until you're called. Let the little children... Now, if I happen to say, bow your head, do it right quick, honey, because evil things leave, such as cancer and diseases, and it goes out amongst the people and gets into others. All that believe that and know it's the Scripture, say amen. amen. We find in the Bible that evil spirits went from one to the other when it's cast out. And they try to find a place. And how many times have we seen in the meeting people come to the meeting perfectly healthy and well, sit there and criticize, and a day or two after that be found totally blind or stricken with a cancer, paralyzed, see, because they were unbelievers. I'm not responsible for them, only for the believers. Many of them went to the institution many years ago and still there. Some went to their grave just because of being arrogant, unbelieving. There's no place for an unbeliever now. It's a place for believers. Have faith in God. Heavenly Father, now the meeting is yours. It's been yours all the time. Now for, I can speak on your word, but now from now on I can't speak. You're the one who speaks now, Lord. Let it be known that your servant has told them the truth. May people here, maybe many are here sick and won't even be in a prayer line, but you're still here, Lord. You can heal out there just as you can heal anywhere. Let thy word be made known. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if I can get your undivided attention for just a moment. I want to look down this prayer line. I don't really believe I know one person. Are you in this prayer line all strangers to me? You know what I don't know? You raise up your hands if you are. You are. How many out there knows that I don't know anything about you? Raise up your hand. Out there, say, sure. Ninety-five percent of the people here. I don't. That's true. Now, here's a little woman. I've never seen her in my life. She's a total stranger to me. Now, she may be here for sickness. 
She may be here. Maybe she's done something. Maybe she's here for finances. Maybe it's domestic trouble. Maybe she's here for someone else. I don't know. I have no idea. But here is exactly a picture that's in St. John, the fourth chapter. A man and a woman meets for the first time. And no doubt that the young woman that met Jesus, he was much older than her because he, they said he looked to be 50 or over 50. And probably this young, beautiful woman was out there at the well was uh, just a young girl. And here again tonight, two people meet, young and old, without knowing one another. And now she stands there. There's some reason she's there. I don't know. She might be standing there as a deceiver. She might be standing there saying something when it isn't just see what will happen. If it is, you watch what happens. Now, I don't know the lady. I've never seen her. She just held her hand a while ago. I was a stranger to her, and I hold my hand. She's a stranger to me. I've never seen her. Well, now, if I, just as a man, I have to say, Lady, what is the matter with you? What are you doing here? What do you want? And she'd say, uh, Mr. Branham, I'm, I'm here because I, I suffer with a, a cancer. I suffer with TB. I suffer with a tumor. Or I'm out of money. I, uh, my husband left me. Or I'm not married and my boyfriend did so. She'd have to tell me. Well, I'd say, all right, I, I'll, I'll pray for you. Lay my hands up on you and say, Lord God, give this woman what she wants. Amen. Jesus, do it. Let her go away. Well, I guess if she believed that, she'd get well. That's all right. That's been a ministry for many, many years. But it was promised in the last days that as the angel God was dwelling in a human body that come up just before Sodom burned, and he sat with his back turned to the tent where Sarah was and told Abraham what she was thinking in the tent. God in a human flesh wearing human clothes. And that's the only way God can do it today is when he gets in your flesh. Amen. See? Showing that God would be manifested in human flesh. Jesus said, as it was at the days of Sodom, so would it be at the coming of the Son of Man. We have the messenger, Billy Graham, and them down there in Sodom. But the elected church received a message and a messenger. Now, if this little lady, if the Holy Spirit don't say he'll do it, but if he would come and tell me what you're standing here for, or, or what you want, or something you've done, or something you're about to do, well, you'd know it have to come from some supernatural source, because we're just standing here. That would be right, wouldn't it? Then you'd know it had to come from a supernatural force. If the Bible said that Jesus did that same thing and promised to do it again in the last days, then you'd believe with him. How many would be the same thing? Then you'd see Jesus. You'd see his word. Now, you say, you see the word? The Bible says he is the word. And the Bible said that the word discerns the thoughts that's in the heart. Is that right? Then it would be the word spoken to human lips, discerning the thoughts. Now, I can't. I have no way of doing it. See? Because I don't know her. But he does. And he is the Word. And he is the one that can take our two spirits, like a woman at the well and him, and blend it, and then go away and show me just what she's here for, what she's done, or what she wants, or something. Then I can speak it and say it. And that's up to her. And I say, Brother Bram, can you heal her? No. No. I can't do that. He's already done it. By stripes, we were healed. But that's just to raise her faith. To let her know that if he knows what she has been and what she's wanting, he knows he knows how to give it and what you will be afterwards. Is that right? Amen. Now everybody believes that. Amen. Now be real reverent, and you people out there now without prayer cards, you pray. Now I remember Jesus passed through a group one day, and a little woman touched his garment, and he turned around and said, "Who touched me?" And he looked all over the congregation till he found her and told her she had a blood issue, and her blood stopped at that time. See? Now, the Bible said that he now is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Is that right? I'm looking out here at Brother Way sitting here by his wife. Just recently, that man was standing here while I was preaching, just like Paul was preaching all night one night, and this man dropped dead right in the audience. And the Holy Spirit brought him right back to life again. He is a witness that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many never did see Brother Wade and would like to see him? Raise up your hand. Never did see him. Brother Wade, would you stand up? Here's the man. 
drop dead about where he's sitting right now. Here's his wife, a registered nurse, standing right there. He had no pulse gone. His eyes turned back. He was black in his face. Heart attack. Doctor told him he had heart trouble. Before that, I found it on discernment not long ago and told him that he had heart trouble. And then all at once his heart stopped and down he went. And there he was, laying there perfectly gone. That's about six or eight times that I've seen the Lord Jesus bring back the dead. I've seen him do it. And he can do it tonight. Now, I take every spirit in here under my control for the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Be reverent. Watch. I want to talk to you, lady. I've been preaching, you see. And just to catch your spirit, that's exactly what I'm doing. See? There's something in you alive, or you wouldn't be standing there. You'd be just a farm laying dead. And uh, you'd have no life in you. But if there is a life in that flesh, it controls you. See? And now even your thoughts and what you think, the words you say and everything, is what you live by. See? That's what you are, is your words, your thoughts, and whatever you are. Now, we are, we are here believing how the Holy Spirit, like Jesus, told the woman, bring me a drink. And when she brought, she said, well, you, you shouldn't ask me that. I'm a, uh, I'm a Samaritan. You're, you are a Jew. We don't have no custom with each other, no, no way, words with each other. Now, of course, we are both Gentiles. And we're standing here just believing on God. Now, if his spirit comes by me for a gift and can tell you what, that you know whether it's right or not because you've lived that part of the life, then, then you have a gift to believe it. And if you will believe it and he will tell you about it, then it's all over. It'll work on everyone here. Now, everybody real reverend. And a lady suffers with something wrong in her throat, a throat condition. That's right, raise up your hand. Now, I've never seen her in my life. That's right. That's what she's here for, for me to pray for her throat. Now, right then, as soon as I said that, or just before, she, was, she knew that there was something near. Something come near right then. You can see the emotion up on her. A real sweet feeling. Like, that light that you see in the picture, where are you at, George? Uh, that light that was in the picture is hanging right over the woman right now. See, it's another dimension. She is a believer. Not a make-believer. She's a believer. Now, being that you are a believer, you believe me to be his servant? Have to be to know that. You believe he could tell you other things that's on your heart? All right. Here's something that's on your heart. It's somebody you're praying for. Child. You believe he can tell me what's wrong with it? It's got a virus. Is that right? You believe God can tell me who you are? You're Miss Walker. You're not from here. You're from the South, Georgia. You're going home well. Jesus Christ is here. Your child. Don't worry about it. It's over. God bless you, sister. Now, here's another one. I don't know her, never seen her. She's just a woman standing there. Now, look, I've been preaching altogether since about 8 o'clock. It's 10 now. That's two hours I've been here. That one discernment weakened me more than uh, two hours of preaching. Okay. That's, see, you say, you mean to say that? Oh, yes. That woman had touched the hem of his garment. He said, I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. Strength. Is that right? That's what it does. Now, here's a woman that I have never seen. Billy went over there, if you noticed something, and picked up that boy that we have here with us, George. He's a Baptist boy. I want him to see that what we're talking about is God. His father's family is a nice people. They're in Mexico. Missionary, fine man. And his father's sick, too. I'm just waiting for him to come. I just watched close, George. Now, this lady, I, I, I don't know her. I, I never seen her. I suppose we're strangers to one another. We don't know each other. But now, the Holy Spirit, the sweetness of Jesus being present, we're all witnessing that. Now, if the Lord Jesus will reveal to me something about you. Now, if I could heal you, I'd do it. But I can't do what he's already done. The only thing, if he was standing here tonight with this suit on it, he gave me. Well, now, he, he couldn't heal you because he's already done it. By his stripes, we were healed. 
see. But the only thing he would could declare himself by the word that he promised and make you see that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he promised to do it. Now, if he will use me to tell you what you are here for, will you use the faith that you have in him to believe that you receive what you have are here for with all your heart? All right. May the Lord grant it. Uh, see, the lady has something wrong. An examination shows it is a, a ruptured stomach. That's true. That's true. Yes, sir. A ruptured stomach. Do you believe that God can heal that rupture? You, all you will. God bless you. Now, you're not from here. Been quite a sacrifice to get here. It was. Yeah, yeah. You're from Tennessee. Yes, That's right. Mrs. Hart, yes, you turn back. Don't doubt. You'll be healed. If thou canst believe. How do you do, lady? We are strangers to one another. I've never seen you in my life as with Noah. I might have somewhere in a meeting you might have seen me, but I don't know you. God knows you. You believe in me to be his servant and the word that I have preached is the truth? Well, being that I am strange to you, and the word that I have preached you have believed on, the only thing that some of them give you a card, either one of the ushers or my son or somebody gave you a card, your number was called, and here you are. That's all I know. But you're here suffering from a nervous condition. It bothers you bad. You have someone with you. You have someone you're praying for. It's, a, it's your husband. And he has a spiritual problem that he just can't get over the rip. And you have a child that's sick, too. You're not from here, but you come from the north. You're from Canada, from Alberta. That is right. You believe me as being God's prophet. And believe that what I tell you is the truth. Go home and you'll receive what you've got. Believe God bless you, Lord. I am a stranger to you. You're a stranger to me. I don't know you. But God does know you. You believe me to be his servant with all your heart? I don't know you, nothing of you. If I could heal you, I'd do so, but I, I can't. I am not a healer. I am just a man. But he's God. I'm uh, just a bit confused because there's an older woman standing between me and you. It's somebody you're praying for. Yes. Yeah, it's your mother. Yes. Yeah. And she suffers with a, a high blood pressure. Yes. And you have a, a kidney infection. Yes. That is right. Yes. You believe that? Yes. Your mother isn't here. But when you go to her, take that scarf that's around your neck and put it on your mother. And don't doubt. And the high blood pressure will leave her and your infection will be gone. Don't believe it. You believe now with all your heart? Amen. Now you see, I look out across the audience and it looks like it's just, it's just beginning to get kind of misty like out there. These things that I do shall you do also. He's done more right here tonight than he, of that type than he did in the entire journey on life. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, this one lady here, <coughs> young woman, I don't know her, she's a stranger to me, but do you believe me to be his servant? <laughs> uh, just a moment, a man come before me, uh, somebody in the audience, uh, just a moment, somebody in the audience that left here just then, that light left here and there was a man standing by him, and somewhere in the audience just don't weary. Just be of a good courage. Let's go back again and see to the woman. Now, if the Lord God, this is six or seven or something, let's pass through the line under discernment. If the Lord Jesus will reveal to me, to this woman, whatever is wrong with her, would it make the rest of you believe with all your heart? Could you accept Christ upon them bases? See? One time or to prove it. Three times is a confirmation. And this is tens of thousands of times without one time being wrong. 
You're not here for yourself. You're here for a man. And I see him sitting with his head down. He's smoking a cigarette. And you're praying that the cigarettes will leave him. <laughs> may the Lord God give you your request, sister. Go believe him with all your heart. And may that devil of heaven leave your husband. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Your trouble's in your back. Do you believe God will make it well? <coughs> All right. Go say thank you, Lord. I know this woman. I believe it's Miss Niece's daughter. Isn't that right? I thought it was. God bless you. The old back trouble will leave you now. You can go and be well. You believe God can heal that arthritis and make you well? Go tell him you believe him. Just believe it all your heart. How do you do, sir? Do you believe God can heal that stomach trouble and make you well? Amen. All right. Then go say thank the Lord. I'm going to be well. And, and you'll, you'll be well. Another arthritis case in the age. Of, do you believe that God will make you well if I lay hands up on you? How many times would you believe your hands on my brother? You hear that? The Lord bless my sister and give her deliverance again tonight. Amen. Just believe it. Heart trouble, stomach trouble. You believe God can heal it? All right. Go in the name of the Lord Jesus. He make you well. How do you do, young fellow? Asthmatic condition. You believe that God can heal asthma? Go believe it. He'll do it. Right. Diabetic condition. You believe that God can heal your blood and make you well? Go believe him and he'll do it. You believe it with all your heart? What if I didn't say nothing to you just laid my hands on you? Did you believe the Holy Ghost is sure to make you well? That's the way to do it. Come here. In the name of Jesus Christ, may you go and be healed. Amen. Come, lady. If I didn't say nothing to you, do you believe God would heal you at that female truck? No, excuse me, you already said it. Go ahead. Go, go believe in you. Be made well. You believe, sir, with all your heart? God heals heart trouble, doesn't he? Makes man well, I, I assure you. He, he's God. Do you believe that? You believe with all your heart? Have faith in God. Some man out here did something just a few minutes ago. I want to find that. His blood. Somebody like an accident or something that happened. It was bleeding. He was somewhere. The man was standing here. I just prayed. Yes, it is. It's a man said, Watch J.T. Parnell. I know the boy. You're bleeding inside, J.T. You believe God will make you well? Or it'll stop then, J.T. Hallelujah! Believe with all your heart. There's a little lady sitting right here looking right across, sitting there with Brother Grimsley. There's a light for her, you, little white collar. Mary? <laughs> I don't know you, but that's your name. You're bothered with the spiritual trouble, and also you're real nervous. Forget it. It's all going to be all right. Believe with all your heart. <laughs> Have faith in God. Thou can only believe. Little lady sitting right back up here in the back row over on the side over there. She's from Michigan. Suffering with a female trouble. You believe God will make you well? Have what you ask for then. You believe it? Amen. Raise up your hand and say, I accept it. All right, you can go home and get well. I don't know the lady. But God does know her. What about you here on this cop? You're the only crippled man or man on a cop. I'm a stranger to you. I don't know you. God knows you. But I say now you're shattered to death. You have cancer. You come from a long ways. You come from Cincinnati here. Your name is Mr. Hawk. Believe with all your heart. If you sit there, you die. Accept Jesus Christ and be healed. You believe him? Then stand up on your feet out of that scripture and accept Jesus Christ. How many in here believe him at this minute? You believe with all your heart? Amen. Then let's every one of you stand up right now. Stand up. Now, in your own way, the way you pray, you lay your hand on somebody next to you. Where is Sister Brown? She's been sitting here suffering with that. The other day she called me on the phone, and she couldn't raise her hands up. I see it was something wrong in her blood. 
When I met her the other day, she's got diabetes. Where is she? She's here in this down long ago. All right, Sister Brown. Tonight, I want you to believe with all your heart. I know you know what's wrong with you. But I want you to believe you come out of the hospital and come here. See? To be prayed for. I'm praying for you. Believe you're going to be well. Margie, have faith in God. Let's go to quit right now. Let's go to Ian. He can heal diabetes. He can heal you of that sickness in your stomach. I each one lay your hands on one another. And just hold your hands there just for a minute. Just lay your hands on one another. Hold. See, it's going on 11 o'clock. Many of these people got drive to Tennessee and different places. Surely the Lord God has proved. What did you see tonight? Did you see a man or did you see Jesus? Jesus confirming his word. Amen. These handkerchiefs laying here, while this anointing is up on me, I have my hands laid up on these handkerchiefs, praying that God Almighty, they said they took from the body of Paul handkerchiefs or aprons. Here's those who were dead and has been raised up. There's those here who were in accidents, smashed up or healed. There's I see Miss Wilson standing here that not long ago she was hemorrhaging to death with TB years ago. Here she is tonight. The doctors didn't give her this hour of sleep. Here she stands tonight. All around through here, lame, blind, crippled, in wheelchairs and everything. They're standing tonight as living trophies. Why is it? Jesus Christ lives. Amen. The same yesterday, today, and forever. That man that just testified a while ago of him down there that had epilepsy, that had it all them years. And everything, and it's one time in the meeting, and that's been around almost 20 years ago. He's never had a seizure since. That's one of the 10,000s. He's a healer. Amen. Amen. He healed. Amen. Now, don't be excited. Just with childlike faith, look away to Calvary. Close your eyes and forget you're in this tabernacle. Close your eyes and forget there's anybody around you. And look to Jesus and see. Look to Jesus now and live. It's recorded in the Word. Hallelujah. It's only that we look and live. Oh, look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. It's recorded in the Word. Hallelujah. It's only that you look and live. Close your eyes to man. Close your eyes to the things around you. And look to your faith to Jesus Christ. And know that He was wounded for your transgressions. By His stripes you were healed. Lord Jesus. As these people are praying, and they have their hands upon each other, and we are realize that we're standing in the presence of the living, resurrected Jesus Christ, in the form of the Holy Spirit, revealing to us the secrets of our hearts, making known to us our desires, and promising us that He would give us our desires if we would only believe. Men and women have their hands on one another. They are praying because we are fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. We are fellow brethren and sisters of Jesus Christ. And Satan, we come to you in the challenge of the name of the Lord Jesus. He is the sword. He is the one who cuts away the sickness. He is the one who cuts away the doubt. He is the conqueror. Now we challenge you in the name of Jesus Christ that you come out of this people, Satan. The Word of God is made manifest. It circumcises, takes away doubt, takes away sickness, and brings perfect deliverance. We pray that the Holy Ghost will fall upon this people and give to them the power of faith to believe that the presence of the omnipotent Christ is here now. Read it, Lord. I condemn every sickness. I condemn all diseases. I condemn all unbelief. In the name of Jesus Christ, may the Holy Ghost honor what I've said and sweep through this building and deliver every person in divine presence. Raise up your hands now and praise.